So I want you to turn with me, if you wouldn't mind, to 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, we're, we're going into a time, and, and it's an interesting prophetic time. I know, I know that there's um, many things happening in the Spirit this year, and, and, and many voices that I listen to, people that are, and influences that I receive from are, are saying some very, very interesting things. I noticed Miss Billy Brim was saying that she believes that her, the prayer assembly coming up in, in Branson is the most important one that they've ever, ever had. And for the things that they're going to be praying into, well, I'm kind of excited about that. Julie and I are going to be there and um, uh, book some tickets to go over there in, uh, just next month. Uh, but there's things stirring around in my spirit, and I'm telling you, I, I just know that we, have, we are in a, in a intense preparation time for the glory of God and in the glory of God and for that glory not just in our services but to be manifest upon us all the time. But there are some things that we've got to be aware of um, as we go into next week. We, we prepare ourselves uh, for that season of time which we study as a church and we do it because of the prophetic influence and significance it has for the church as we go into uh, Rosh Hashanah the Feast of Trumpets, which reminds us and signifies for us uh, the, the announcement, the trumpet blast that announced the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it's on that actual day or whether that day just signifies it, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. But it does point to and signify the, the coronation, the, the coming of the King and, and the, the return of Jesus. So, so as, if, as, as far as I know, uh, we'll be... Looking, starting to look into that next, uh, next Sunday and then of course going into Yom Kippur um, and, and so forth and so on. And these things are important for us to understand because they remind us again uh, that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And as a church we, we have, I think, got a fairly good handle on the cross and, and, and what that means for us. But there is a highlight and it's been uh, in, in even uh, highlighted again this year uh, more and more so in my spirit, of, of recognizing and understanding and, and fixing my eyes ready and waiting and expecting the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how does that affect me? And what is that, how does that affect my decisions and what I'm, what I'm doing and the, what I do today and what I do tomorrow and what I do with my finances and how I speak to my wife and, and, and the decisions that I make? All of these things are affected by Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. You know, and, and the Re book of Revelation tells us in the spirit of them and the bride, our response, the spirit and the bride say, come. In fact, we should be hastening and drawing on and pulling on God, uh, 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 Jesus, to come. Yeah. You know, this is something that, you know, you can, if you talk around the Christian world, there is a segment of church that are, are terrified of this. Now, they don't know. They really don't know, in, in my estimation, the Jesus that I'm talking about. Then, people are afraid of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, um, when you get a revelation of the heart of the Father, when you get a revelation of how much He loves you, you 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 will no longer be filled with a dread of that moment. Uh, you will you'll be filled with an anticipation and an excitement of what that means. Some people are, uh, don't want Jesus to come because they think it's going to be boring after that. You know, well, <laughs> well, you know, we're just going to be in heaven floating around on clouds, you know, and playing harps and stuff. And I've joked about this before, you know, eating Philadelphia cheese and all that stuff. But <laughs> no, that's not, what, that's not what it's going to be like. It's going to be glorious. I'm telling you, it's going to be absolutely like you've never been able to even dream up yet. And beyond that moment where we spend some time with the Lord in heaven, beyond that moment where we come and we start to manifest and walk out some of the destiny that God's given us, we're going to rule and reign with Jesus over this earth. Boring? No, I don't think so. Now, you may have some things that aren't in your life anymore, like cancer and sickness and, you know, and, and depression. And, I mean, but I'm quite happy to say goodbye to any of those sorts of things, you know. There will be some things you won't be, that you won't be doing anymore. Uh, you know, after a certain point, you won't be witnessing and leading people to Christ. and You won't be laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. That's for this dispensation right now. You are the manifestation of God on the earth right here and right now. This is what we need to be doing now. So, 
So in which way, in what way are we supposed to be conducting ourselves? In what way are we supposed to be conducting our lives? What, what, when we wake up in the morning, what are the decisions that we make? And how does that define and, and, and really identify how, how we're going to live our lives? So the Lord led me uh, 15 minutes before I left for the church to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want to read through this passage with you. And we'll just see what the Lord wants to say to us through it. I've re- I have read through it a few times. It's not, I know what's in there, uh, and I suspect what the Lord wants to say. But let's read through this together. Uh, 1 Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the, disperse, of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So he's, he's reading uh, to quite a few people. Uh, all over the place. This letter will have been distributed quite far and wide. Verse 2, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, there's an election and, and a sanctification and a separation and a cleansing. And these people are identified as those who have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Well, that's a, that's a completely holy place sanctified, set apart. That's how Peter's identifying them. And he says, Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's begotten us again. We're born again, people. Brand new, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. Now this is important to understand because as a born again person, as a Christian, you you don't just identify with what you've been saved from, but you identify also with what you've been saved to. Many people get born again and think, well, I'm saved from hell. I'm saved from that. I'm saved from those things. I, I'm saved. And even if you get an advanced understanding of that and understand that you're, you're delivered and you're saved from sickness, disease, poverty, and so forth and so on, well, that still puts you in, in, a, in a starting point, but it isn't positive on anything. It's, it's got rid of the negatives, but you're still standing there. So what does it mean if you've been set free from poverty? Not just that you're, you're now no longer in debt, but that there is a place of prosperity to step into. What does it mean that you've been set free from sickness and disease and by His stripes you were healed? Listen, folks, that doesn't just mean that you no longer have to identify with sickness. There is an overflow, an abundance of life for you to step into and to operate in. Your physical body should literally be buzzing with the life of God. How many of you have ever, you know, shook someone's hand or touched someone and, and you had that static shock the other day? I, that happened. I touched my wife the other day. I was, I was going in for a kiss, actually, and, and there was this little static shock. And then she wouldn't go anywhere near me after that. She's like, oh, you're going to shock me again. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I was trying to explain to her that, you know, that once, that re- once that's released, you know, and anyway, it didn't work. I didn't get a kiss. But, but, but in, the, in, in a similar way, we should literally be buzzing with the life of God. That, you know, you know, that life, that power, that virtue that was on the apostles, people try to get it within shadow's distance of them to get in contact with what was, what was radiating out of them. So it's not just you've been saved from so that you're just at point zero. You've been given something to step into, which is life and life abundant. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, listen to it again. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. That means it can't be messed up. And does not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Now here here it is. So you've got this heavenly existence, this heavenly manifestation, all that. That's true, but if you, and if you stop there, then we would just think it's all for us when we get to heaven. But this is what he says next. Ready to be revealed in the last time. 
All, all of that stored up, ready to be revealed in the last time. Folks, we're in the last time. We're in the last of the last time. And, and we've got to allow God to be revealed through us. All of that life, all of that prosperity, everything that's good and everything that God wants to manifest through us to show himself good to the world, you have to allow that to come through you. Hallelujah. He wants to show himself strong on your behalf. Verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does all that mean? It means that stuff's going on around you, in case you hadn't noticed it. There's trials and there is stuff going on around you that in this current state, because the world is still affected by the curse, because there are people who are still demonized and demon-possessed, because there are evil things and governments and, 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 and mindsets and influences working around this world, you are surrounded by those trials, in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> but all of that, all of that, all, the, the, all of those trials that you've been grieved by actually gives opportunity for, your, for the genuineness of your faith to go into operation. The book of James teaches the same thing. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces an endurance. See, God is not the one who's pro providing that particular uh, testing of your faith He's not the one who's grieving you with these various trials. These trials is the word parismos, which is the word for temptations. And God does not tempt. James goes on to say God does not tempt, neither can he be tempted. So, so God is not the one who's trying to provide the trials for you. God is the one providing the genuine faith for you to overcome through these trials. So it goes on and it says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found. And here's what should not be launching out of you at this point in, in time and in history. This is what the church should be known for. That it doesn't matter how much pressure and how much persecution and how much trial comes against a particular individual or a body of people, what happens is we erupt into praise. I mean, think about how the apostles handle it in prison. They are, now, now, they're thrown, now they're not just thrown into prison. Now get, get out of your mind what you see on television with this nice comfy cell and a, and a bed and a, you know, a toilet in the corner. You know, I mean, that doesn't sound like the Ritz, but it's still, compared to what these guys were thrown into, I mean, they're talking, you know, it's horrible. I mean, there could be other dead people in the cell, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, it's horrible. And, and not only that, they're thrown into this very dirty, uh, horrible, dark, damp, mouldy uh, environment and, and, they, and they've been beaten and there's open wounds. And so, so, so what do the disciples do? They don't they sit there and say, oh, my goodness, look at us. Oh, woe is us, Lord. Now, what do they do? They have a praise party. And they start, I mean, can you imagine these guys? All you can, I mean, they, I think they were, you know, doing the chains in time with the rhythm, you know. I mean, I think they had, you know, and, and, the, and the other, they doing it loud enough, all the other people can hear them. And, and they're singing there and, and they're just, woo, hallelujah, we're praising God. And they're praising and you can hear chains rattling and the praise going on and everything else. Why? Because of the pressure that came upon them in their particular time and season. There was a grace they knew how to step into that, that supplied such a strength on the inside of them that it came up and erupted in praise. Hallelujah. Now in that particular situation, what did that do? It, provided, it caused the power of God to be manifest and their chains fell off. <laughs> I mean, whatever was binding them physically no longer had the power to do that if they weren't bound internally. So what is this that through tested by fire may be found to praise, honour and what? Glory 
at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, when Jesus comes, when He is revealed to us, when we see Him in the clouds, that, that our, our stature, our stance, our place and our position is praise, honour and glory. That's, that's what we're supposed to look like. That, that we're, known, we're known for our praise, that we, that we get our praise on when the pressure's on. That we continue to bring, we, we, we are continually a people and a place of honour. We honour one another. And we're a place and a manifestation of glory. Of glory. The glory of God. Hallelujah. Whom having not seen you love. Now Jesus is going to be revealed to us and we will see him with our eyes. But right now we haven't seen him. I don't know if anybody else here has ever seen him in the flesh. We have, well, you won't have seen him in the flesh. <laughs> Some of you may have had a vision of Jesus, but that's still not the same as what's going to take place when we will see him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice. Now here it is. Here's what happens with this revelation of Jesus that's building up on the inside of him. With joy inexpressible and full of glory. See, there's that joy and that praise and that glory again going on. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. See, here's what I'm hearing the Lord saying through this whole service today, is that we are in a time that we've got to be in step with Him. And in this time, if God, didn't, if God did not plan to grace you with what you needed, He would not have had you born in this time. That's right. He... he, he he has already planned out the supply that's necessary for you to walk out the call of God on your life. Amen. Every single one of you. Now you might be sitting there thinking, man, you don't know my situation. You don't know the challenges that I'm facing. You don't know the pressures. That I... You don't know mine either. <laughs> you look up here, Pastor Chris, you know, whatever. And lovely family, kids all serving God and everything. You have no idea some of the challenges that we've faced over the years. Some of the things that we've had to walk through. Some of the things that we, got, we were down and didn't know if we'd be able to get up again. And the grace of God helped us and picked us up. Got us walking again and then got us running and then got us cheering. You hear what I'm saying? Every single one of you, you've got real situations in your life. But I'm telling you that there is a supply in God for these days. But the key is you're going to have to be in step with Him. You can't be doing your own thing any longer. There's too, many, there's too many people in the church that are still trying to live their own path and fight against and pull against what the Spirit of God has destined them to, to, to do and to be. And we're going to have to yield. We're going to have to listen and we're going to have to yield. And we're going to have to determine that what, what God wants for us and what He's determined for us is, 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 is what we're going to go after. And we can't let... Uh, the, the salary or, or, or the position or the influence or the whatever else it is that you vocationally minded are, are, are thinking that you need to head towards, we can't let any of that be the determining factor in these days. It must be and only be, what does God want me to do now? Because, I, because if the Lord was to return next Tuesday, let's just pick a day, all of that other stuff is going to be absolutely the last thing that you're concerned with. And all that's going to be presented and in the face of Jesus, when you look into His eyes, what you want to see is well done, good and faithful servant. And that's going to be based on whether or not you lived according to what God has told you to do. Now, His judgment in that place is not going to be a judgment of whether or not you were good enough to get into heaven or whether, you know, that, no, 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 that's, that's not what we're talking about here. But we are told that Jesus is going to, uh, is going to uh, judge and it's, we, it's going to be a different judgment to what the world, how the world is, judges, but, is judged, but there's still going to be a place where we come before him and what we've done and what we've said is presented. And we are rewarded from that place. 
And I'm telling you, I, I don't want to look into the eyes of Jesus and see anything but absolute pleasure in that I was full-heartedly chasing after him and his call on my life. I've said this before and we've joked about it before, but the person, you know, the person that's, man, they're working hard and they're just like, you know, man, I'm, I, you know, when I get my mortgage paid off, then I'm going to serve God. You know, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to work all hours and everything else. And in the process of it, you know, the kids walk away from the Lord and eventually they sit there and they finally get the house paid off and the next day Jesus comes. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's going to happen for someone. Somewhere along the line, that's going to happen. The day Jesus comes, someone's mortgage was paid off yesterday. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's going to be the case for someone. And what, wouldn't after all that work and all that time and all that money you've just paid in, now the house is mine and you don't even get to live in it. <laughs> You're going to be in heaven with something a million times better that Jesus has already prepared for you. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, God, God, wants, God gives you all think, good things to enjoy. Richly gives you these things. Does he want you to live in a nice place? Of course he does. Does he want you to have life? Yes, he does. That's not the point. We don't chase these things. We, he wants to add these things to you because he wants them to be part of your demonstration of his goodness on your life. But, but we can't be trying to chase these things by our own design because we're going to just find ourselves, you know, in that moment. I mean, it's somewhere in that moment between leaving here and meeting him, there's going to be a... I think a, probably a moment of regret if you'd lived that way. Once you get to heaven, there's no tears and stuff, you know. Or at least it says he wiped them away, you know. But, but I'm telling you, we've got a moment in time left. It's what it feels like to me. We've just got a moment in time left. And I'm going to, I for one, I'm going to chase hard after God and continue to. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Again, there's that glory that comes because Jesus suffered on the cross. He enabled a glory manifestation to be on his church. Verse 12, talking about the Old Testament saints. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Listen to this, this is kind of cool. Things which angels desire to look into. There's a, there's a time now where this glory is manifest, manifest. There's going to be a, re, a revealing, a spirit of seeing and knowing. We're going to see further prophetically and, and, and insightfully by revelation into things in the Word. We're going to see things. It's going to be very, very clear to us that not even angels know anything about. You know, the Bible actually says that as, a, as the church, you will in, one day you will sit actually and judge angels. It's in the scripture. You will actually judge them. You'll be deciding certain things concerning them. Well, angels don't know everything then. Well, thank God for that, because if that were the case, if angels knew everything, then Lucifer would know everything. You know, There's been certain things which are hidden, and mysteries revealed. And the mystery, primary mystery that was hidden concerning the church was the, was the glorious church. And Christ in you, the hope of that glory. And so now there's a manifestation of that. Now, verse 13 says, Therefore, now this is, this is how you need to, in view of those things we've just talked about, this is the mindset that you need to now live like. This is how you need to think. When you get up and go to work, and you do what you do during the day, there's a certain mindset and a certain stature that you need to enter that day with. Here it is. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So again, with God, with Jesus coming in your view, you, you, you live out your day mindful of his, of his coming and the grace that is now available for you to live in prior to His and at His appearing. As absent children... Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, sorry, as absent, as obedient children, 
Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. In other words, don't live like you used to. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. In other words, what does that mean? Holiness, what does that mean? Let's just define it. It doesn't mean what, you know, there was a holiness movement that was on the earth a while back. And what that meant for those people was uh, you have to dress in black from here to here and, you know, you no know makeup and no jewellery and, you know, that's holy. That's not holy. That's just, you know, boring actually. But, um, and no, and no we, you know, the, the, the obviously there is a, an extreme on the other side which says anything goes and, you know, you can show up uh, you know, I've, you, I've, I mean, I've been to some churches and I've seen some people show up in some things and, and very little things. You know, so, so we're not talking about the extreme on the other side either. But what is, if there's true holiness and separation on the inside, it's going to manifest in, some, in a level of modesty. Can I just say it that way? It's going to manifest in some level of self-respect. You're not going to walk around, uh, you know, with, 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 with your crotch down by your ankles and... You know, your underwear showing and stuff. That, that's, that, well, there's no self-respect in that. And, and in fact, you, don't, if you, don't, you can research if you don't even know, want to know what that actually represents. It came out of the prison culture. You don't want to know what that represents. Some kids wouldn't dress like that if they actually knew what they were representing, what they were, the statement they, that they were making. But it's somehow gotten involved in some of the culture and so forth and so on. But holiness is not in the outward adorning and appearance. But I, but I can tell you, that the out, how you present yourself and how you adorn on the outside is going to have some things to do with how, how much value you feel on the inside. And when you know that you're his, you're his beloved, when you know what he's done for you and what he gave for you, and when you not understand that he's made you the righteousness of God and, and you are cherished and loved and beautiful and, and he's made you perfect as, and everything, else, then that, that, when you truly have a revelation of that, it's going to manifest on the outside. You know, all of, the, all of the disorders that go on in, in, in the uh, psyche, the way people perceive themselves in different directions, you know, with, with bulimia and, and anorexia and, and, and some of the other things too. People can have de eating disorders that go in the opposite direction. And, and people, the way people to see themselves and perceive themselves, some people literally see themselves in a mirror completely different to how they are. That all comes from the inside. And that all needs healing and changing. And there's a full revelation of, of how you are. I used to dress. I used to dress in, in a way to just shock people. I just, with the orange hair and all of that, that was all about just trying to, trying to shock people. That was all it was. And there was a whole reason for that in my growing up and everything else and attention seeking and all of those sorts of stuff. Well, when you're secure on the inside, you don't have to live like that. Uh, and there is a, a holiness, a true holiness um, that, will, that will manifest. Now, um, here he says this, But he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Why? Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now, the wonderful thing about statements that God makes like that, when God says be something, it's not a suggestion, it's an empowerment. When God said light be, light was, the, the ability for light to be was in the words that said light be. So when God says holy be, because I'm holy, be holy because I'm holy, in the statement be holy is the empowerment of holiness. Isn't that good? It's not a, just a suggestion. It's a faith statement by God for you to be separated, sanctified, and as He is in this world. Praise God. The Bible says, as He is, so are we in this world. Well, if He is holy, then you are holy. If, is Jesus holy? Let's ask ourselves the question, is Jesus holy? Yeah, we'd all agree Jesus is holy. But some of us have problems believing that we are holy. Well, are you part of the body of Christ or not? Because if you're a part of Jesus, then which part of him is not holy, the part that you are? You know, well, he's, he's holy. The whole part of him is holy except his little finger. And that must be me. That must be my part right there because I'm not holy. No, 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 no. He is holy. Holy. 
He's holy, holy. W-H-O-L, yeah. He's holy, holy. And he's also holy. I mean, <laughs> no, anyway. But <laughs> be holy, for I am holy. <laughs> That's three holy. I didn't, never thought about it. That'll preach somewhere. <laughs> look, look out for that message. And if you call on the Father, now that's an interesting statement in itself because that's describing a relationship that you understand. Without partiality, who without partiality judges according to each one's work. Now here it is. And this is the verse that actually drew me to this passage of Scripture. Conduct yourselves throughout, your, throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now that makes it sound real temporary, doesn't it? Like this is not our home. This is not our future. Now we'll rule and reign over it and there's going to be new heavens and new earth and all sorts of things. But he's, he's talking about this, the way you're supposed to conduct yourselves right now in this time of your stay here, this temporary moment. You're, you're here on an assignment you're here from heaven on an assignment. He's allowed you to stay here. You're still in that physical body as an assignment for God, from God for a temporary stay. Your home is in heaven. Your home is in the presence of God. But your assignment and your stay, your visitation moment is right now while you're still here on this, on this earth. Because you don't, you don't belong to this anymore. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by the tradition of the fathers, of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So, so you've been cleansed to a state without blemish and without spot in Christ by his own blood. That blood has cleansed you. That blood has sanctified you. It's separated you. And because of that, you're supposed to conduct yourselves in a certain way now. Not to try to gain his pleasure. He's already pleased with you because of what Jesus has done and made you. Not to try to get into heaven. That's already secured by that blood, by the same sacrifice. You conduct yourselves now in this way because it's actually what you are and who you are. And because the grace of God has been supplied for you to be able to walk out living that way. If you try to live any other way, you'll actually step out of the grace that's been provided for you. And you'll find yourselves walking a really hard life. You, you could be the same way. You could, you could really want to be an evangelist, a preacher, preaching to thousands of people, and God's called you to be a lawyer. But you think, oh, no, but a, you know, a preacher would be much more pleasing to God. Not if he called you to be a lawyer, it's not. And you could go out there and go to Bible college, and you could set up and start doing you know, crusades and see millions of people come to Christ through your ministry. But you will not have been walking in a grace that was supplied for you. You were supposed to be helping people as a lawyer. We need some good lawyers, don't we? We need some good Christian lawyers. Hallelujah. Or a doctor or a whatever God's called you to be. If he has called you to the fivefold ministry, as the apostle, the prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, then to do anything else, to chase anything else, is going to be outside of your grace. Now, you, as holy, are separated from and to. So you've been separated from the way you used to live, but you've been separated to something. What is the to something for you? And you've heard us say this before. It doesn't matter if God tells you, God tells you to go and work at McDonald's for 10 years. Now, what does that matter? It's got nothing to do with your income level, as far as God's concerned, because His riches in glory by Christ Jesus provide that for you. If he has an assignment for you there, then you do that. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just that you tap into and do what he, whatever it is that he has called you and graced you for. 
So conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were re not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by, your tr by tradition from your fathers. In other words, what, even, even the things that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation are not supposed to determine and dictate to you what it is that God's called you to be. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish or spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for, for you. Who through him believed God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit of sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, and here it is again, not of corruptible seed. We've, we've already, we already found out earlier that it couldn't be corrupted. But incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. For all Flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing through that passage, and, and this is, as I said earlier, this came to me and strongly, and I, I, I read through it a, uh, just a couple of times before I got in the car to come here, and I just knew that God was redirecting. There is a, a standpoint, a, a way in which we're supposed to conduct ourselves that we're supposed to steer our lives to, to understand how we're supposed to live. Every single one of us on a daily basis is supposed to woke up, wake up in the morning and we are supposed to conduct ourselves. That means on purpose live a certain way. Knowing the holiness, the separation that you have. Knowing the sanctification and the grace that enables you. Now there's many people in this congregation working and living in different different communities, different streets, different jobs, different places, come in contact with many different influences during the week. Every single one of you is called to be a light in those places. Every single one of you is called to be the love of God in that place. Every single one of you should stand out and shine. And I believe with all of my heart that you are going to see people start to seek you out. Now that doesn't relieve you of your responsibility of being bold and going out and sharing the gospel with people even if they weren't seeking you out. I, I want to encourage you to still do that. But I do believe you're going to find if you will live this way and if you'll conduct yourself this way, people are going to knock on your door, metaphorically speaking. They may, not, they may physically knock on your door, but I, I mean like they're going to come and ask you because you are a demonstration of the glory of God in their lives. I believe with all my heart. So our, our place, our perspective, our responsibility right now is to conduct ourselves in this time while we're staying here in our temporary time that's left in reverence, in awe of God, in holy fear, walking out and not wanting to miss out on anything that God has already preordained and prepurposed that he's provi provided for us by way of grace for us to to do. I don't want to miss what God's got for me in these days. I don't want to miss a moment of it. I want to be in the right place at the right time doing the, doing the things that God's wanted, given me to do. And I, and I pray that that's your heart as well. Would you stand up with me? I'm going to pray over you. Hallelujah. And I want you to come before the Father and I want you to just get real serious with God for a moment. Having heard these words, I just want you to get real serious with God for a moment. And I want you to lay your life, your education, your vocation, your job, your everything that you've got that's functional of your life right now, I want you to lay it before the Lord for a moment. Every part of it. See, I, I do believe we're actually entering into a day where whatever can be shaken will be shaken. And if you've built your life, your job, your education, your vocation, if you've built all that on, on shaky ground, that, that, that's not going to... Now you, you know, it's going to just come tumbling down. 
when things start to shake. And it's not that God's trying to shake you and destroy you and everything else. It's just that stuff's going to shake. But God has, God has not built you with hay, wood, and stubble. He's provided for you to be planted on a rock. He's not made you out of stuff that's corruptible and, and, and impure. He's made, he's made things gold for you. And so I want you to just get real serious with God for a moment. There's no point hanging on to something that can just come tumbling down in a moment. You see some of you see the floods in Houston and after, after earthquakes. Again, people who had spent their entire life trying to pay off this beautiful house and in a moment it's gone. Well, what was the value? What was the worth of that? I want you to lay it all before the Lord for a moment. I believe every single one of you has got absolute purpose and plan, destiny, calling, and grace of God ready to be revealed to you right now in this last time. And I know God believes in you. You believe in God, but God believes in you. I believe in you. I believe in the destiny and call of this church. I believe He's purposed us here to be here. I know that because we're still here. <laughs> there are many opportunities for His church not to be here anymore, but it's still here and it's still strong in vision, strong in purpose, strong in prayer. It doesn't matter how hard the devil's tried to shake the foundation, what, what's been true, has stayed solid. That's the purpose of God. So just take a moment with God right now. And I want you to say this, Father, I place my whole life before you now. I lay it all down at your feet, every part of it, all of my health, all of my wealth, all of my dreams, my aspirations, my education, my vocation, everything that I have and everything that I am, I place it at your feet, Father. And I determine from this moment on that I will pick up only that which you direct me to. I believe I receive wisdom right now so that every step that I take from this moment forward agrees with your plan and your purpose Holy Spirit help me conduct my life during the time of my stay here with the purpose of God with the plan of God to pursue the things of God I thank you for this, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.